Just normal, regular. My. No, that's not my regular. That's not regular. Cre yay. Dad. Can you say my life creative? My life creative. It often felt like it didn't work in terms of a piece of art that I wanted to produce. It was something that we shared a love for doing together somehow. I could go out and take photographs and that's where my joy sits, is in the actual experience of interacting with whoever I'm photographing, being outside. That whole experience feels magical. And welcome to another episode of MyLifeCreative.com. I am Richard Zombeck. I'm here with the high in my noon and the flap in my jack, <laughs> Pamela Joy. Hello, Richard. How are you today? I'm doing just fine. All right. Well, uh, in this episode, we have an interview with Lily Love. And yes, that's her real name. Um, but before we get to that... Uh, I do want to remind people to go to mylifecreative.com where you can find out information about us, information about the show, show notes for all of our episodes, as well as our archived episodes, and ways to support us. So, Pamela, you did this interview. Let's hear a little bit about Lily Love, and then we'll listen to the interview. I would be happy to. Um, she is very much what her name might sound like. She is a darling. And I've I've known her for many years now. We met in a workshop online. And I just got very close with her. I felt a connection with her. Um, and over the years, I've watched her. She's migrated away from photography a little bit. but And while she doesn't necessarily feel creative all the time... Um, most of her life has gone into helping heal her, her boy who's very sick and has a uh, Lyme disease. So while she doesn't necessarily feel creative, I see that all that energy she has around creativity just got channeled into other areas. And so we talked a lot about that. We talked about what it was like before when her boy was healthy and well and what life looked like and now what life looked like what life is like now on the other side of this and what her day-to-day -day looks like and how she feels and how she deals with this. So I think that her, she's very relatable to a lot of different people. Plus she just has the coolest accent because she lives in the UK. <laughs> so I thought she would be really fun to have on the show for a variety of reasons with a message that extends beyond creating. Yeah. Accents are cool, especially when you're there because they're not accents to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with with that, let's listen to the interview. And um, again, this is uh, uh, Pamela Joy um, interviewing Lily Love. My wife creative. How I know you or how we met was in photographing and we were in a workshop together online. And all the work that I saw that, that you, a, a lot of it was you and your boy taking yeah. walks and in the forest and in the woods and exploring and discovering. He's like a little nature boy. And he seemed, um, um, in a way, he softly gave you permission, yes. but he was very much a part of your work. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit if you want just remember what it was like or what you did or how things were and what he was like and all that he, i think that paints a good picture of before yeah he led a lot with what we did um it was a very it was a way that we enjoyed being together um and it was something that we shared a love for doing together somehow mm -hmm. um and I could definitely never get him to do anything he didn't want to do or <laughs> pose any way he didn't want to pose and most of the time it would be just the two of us out in the woods um he got very good at saying oh look at the light over here and finding those sorts of places this would be a good place um mm -hmm. And he, you know, I could make suggestions, but at the end of the day, he was running the show. 
<laughs> what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful and experience. It, yeah, and it was. It was, you know, and when I look at the pictures, I remember his excitement. Um, I remember him the saying, how about this? Or let's go here and that kind of thing. Other times there was just, he would just be playing wildly, doing his own thing, and I would just be a spectator. <laughs> but I think that's how it started. Mm. But he liked to be involved. You know, he liked to think of ideas. Um, he's very creative himself. He's yeah, he really is. He really is. And I think, um, and he's a bit like me in that he's not great at drawing and he's not great at writing. Um, but he can see mm -hmm. that, you know he can see a picture he can see the light he can see how it would come together so it was very playful that's a good word for th I always see like a gentleness and a um a sensory they feel very ex I can sense where you are they have mm -hmm. a good sense of place and um atmosphere yeah they were and it was sometimes, you know, there's no denying that sometimes I would have something in mind that I would want to portray, <laughs> and he didn't want anything up to do with it. <laughs> so it was, you know, at times I would feel frustrated, um, but I learnt that if I we just went with it and worked, it was more, I say worked together, it was more like played together, because mm -hmm. it was play for me and it was play for him, so... Um, so yeah, this, it, and this was a while, like many years you, you worked yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess. How old was he when you started with it? Do you know, I don't remember. I want to say five. Yeah, because it seemed like he was little and yeah, then you watched him little. grow up a I, little bit. I think when I got my first big camera, he was about six, five or six. And... He, there was not many other things that we, in, we in, he enjoyed me reading to him, which we used to do together. Um, as you can probably tell, he's quite a headstrong and free-spirited child. <laughs> he inherited so, that as well. <laughs> yeah, so he didn't enjoy um, some of the other activities that, like, a lot of kids might like you might do with your children I guess so that for us was something that was a really gorgeous way to spend time together well it encompasses so many different things one yeah. being outside to discovering things in nature or finding things together and then three sharing in this whole like um intimacy around yeah. And making we, something together. Yeah, and we always would take flasks of tea or hot chocolate with us. And it was very, yeah, it was very much a little adventure every time, I guess. You made it special. So, yeah. Well, let me ask you this. on the, so, so thinking back, were there times when it didn't work? <laughs> Where you went out to find something and it didn't um, happen, but it I, was still a beautiful adventure? Yes, I think... For me, it off because I would have a preconceived idea, it often felt like it didn't work in terms of a piece of art that I wanted to produce. Mm -hmm. um, so it felt that I couldn't um, necessarily make the picture that was in my head. So sometimes that was... That was probably ongoing, but it was always, I suppose it was always a bit of a surprise of, as to what we got and about embracing that, the result of that. It was, um, a, you know, there, there was at no point could I have been in charge, I suppose. Even if I had offered a little pocket money or something, it would still... <laughs> be on his terms he might wear a hat that perhaps he wouldn't do it on a normal occasion do you know what I mean he might right, go, right, yeah, right, right. Right, I'll put that on <laughs> but that would be as far as I could get to push what I wanted and the rest of it was all him 
it's almost like um just the way you describe that because sometimes you, you know i think of being in a moment and having an expectation and not meeting that expectation and then years go by and i look back at images from that time and i see all kinds of things i didn't see then yeah and it helps me today walk away from an experience like just like you said a surprise i'm surprised to find something that surprises me even if it's not what i expected know that my normal brain is going to go well that is that blows. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. not what you came to. And it really wants to almost like rip me down off this little like, oh, I felt so good. That was so much fun. Right. I had so much. It was so fulfilling. But they're the results and they're not what they're supposed exactly. to be. And yeah. don't you suck. Completely. And, 100%. Yeah. And so it's almost like being reminded that that is your brain that's a, that's been trained to think that way it compares it computes it analyzes it says this 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 and this it, there's no softening in it that there's another part spirit soul heart whatever that can kind of go hello <laughs> we had a good time yes there's something really cool here just what you yeah. said playful yeah and I, I mean i said to somebody just the other day i said that I could go out and take photographs and that's where my joy sits is in the actual experience of interacting with whoever I'm photographing, being outside. That whole experience feels magical. Sometimes it feels like I could do with not ever looking at the pictures that I've taken. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, I, that, I, that's yeah. enough that, and, and almost the pictures can never live up to the experience. Yes. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. So here you are trotting along. How old was, was he when all this happened? When, when, when the, when the turn, when things turned, because oh. I remember that picture that you showed that one week of him in a wheelchair yeah. and sitting, he wa was... it was the saddest little, what happened here? Yeah. I'm trying to think it was, about two and a half years ago. So he was 10, I think. Um, That's a lot for a 10 year old to process. Yeah. Um, and it, he literally woke up and couldn't get out of bed. Couldn't walk. How frightening. Yeah. And of course I was horrible. Cause I said, no, nope, come on, we've got to go to school. <laughs> Well, that that's normal, yeah. you know. So, but it was, you know, it was frightening, and it was the, and it's interesting because obviously he got a lot worse from there, and we've both talked about how we would do anything to go back to when he was well enough to go out in a wheelchair, because it then became that he was, you know, pretty much housebound. So he has, he's he's got Lyme, he's got chronic Lyme, yes, yeah. and. What have cliff notes, whatever you want to talk about around that, because I, I know people that have it. I know people that are battling. Uh, is it Lyme? Is it ALS? Is it this? And it's it's a circle and a circus and it's draining and exhausting. And you go on this emotional ride and you never do get an answer. No. You spin around in like circles. You're like on a teacup going round and round and round and it's round. It's very, round and round very and round. scary because you don't feel that you have it's very lonely because it's in a funny way. I, the only word I can think of is it's not a respected illness. So mm -hmm. um, Daisy was got ill at the age of eight and she was diagnosed at the age of 11 with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME. We now she's been diagnosed with Lyme also. So we had, ye I mean, Daisy was sick her entire childhood and that was without, we had no support at all through any of that. So I suppose for me now, um, I've spent most of my mothering being a full-time carer for, mm -hmm. for 
both of them. Um, and we haven't, in one sense, I guess we haven't got any answers. On one hand, I don't care. I just want them to be okay. Um, and I want them to be accepted, even if they're sick. It's like I've reached a point where trying to fix them continuously was not a healthy environment for any of us. At some point, we had to accept the fact that this is where we were. They were sick. I had to care for them. And we had to embrace that. Obviously, through that, we still keep trying every different doctor, different, you know, remedies, different, you know, solutions that have helped other people. Um, and I just have to remain strong in the thought that this is their path and something good eventually will come out of it. I think that's the only way you can look at it. It is, otherwise. And then obviously there's parts of me that feel completely heartbroken and grief stricken um, because it's not what you imagine being a mother will be. Mm -hmm. No, it's um, you kind of, I suppose I was very, very naive and thought it would be all baking cookies and. (laughs) <laughs> I don't think it's I naive. I think it's an expectation. I literally did believe that if I, you know, I had that that whole thing. If I did it right, it they would be all right. But it doesn't work like that. So there's some element of control I had to learn to let go of, I guess. And in the midst of all of this, right at the be- almost right, no, I guess it was right before. Maybe I'm I'm incorrect in the timeline. But your home was filled with mold? Yes, we had, we were living in an old house. Basically, we had to, we were living um, up north in England. And where we were living, we were very isolated. It was utterly beautiful, but we had no family around us. And we were living in a farmhouse in kind of the middle of nowhere. And it was stunning and beautiful and idealistic. But Daisy got sick. And I was then stuck at home with her and really, really needed the support of family. So we moved back to where I grew up. And the house that we moved back into was very old and dilapidated. And we had no heating, we had mold, we had rats. It was just not fun in any way. Um, And it was a long process getting to the point where we could rebuild and, um, and now we are here and happy, obviously, but it was a long process. Well, see from as a watcher of your life (laughs) and not a liver of your life, um, I have seen and almost am giddy with, I can't wait for you to show things that you do in your house, your little crafts. Even when you were living in the dilapidated situation, you always find a way to bring a little light and a little joy and a little lily to the world. Oh, like thank your you. It's a desperation, I... Pamela. It's a desperation. <laughs> well, it's just beautiful. I like... cannot. It's. I think it is almost in reaction to. I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes I think, gosh, if all of that hadn't happened, and all the energy that that's taken, that perhaps you know I could have created something really amazing. But on the other hand, there's the creating bit is the thing that has kept me going, and has it was an absolute determination always to make everything right, no matter how not right it was. Um, well, and I think that is what drives me to um, keep creating stuff and trying to make places feel nice. It's all about that feeling. Well, it's very playful. And I want to know, so I, I want some stories. I know that you have a massive teacup collection. Yes, uh, which none of my family support. (laughs) I support it. (laughs) How many do you have? I don't know. I do know that when we moved, there was an over 90. (laughs) Um, 
and they honestly make me really happy. Do you uh, use a different one each day? I have different. I just go with my gut. I, it sound makes me sound so ridiculous, but I just get such little bits of joy from having. So some of them, like I've got ones that belong to my grandma that are really special. And occasionally it just feels like, right, it's time for a grandma cup of tea. And then I've got others that are just, to me, I, my excuse in buying many of these cups was that it was affordable art. Because most cups are about, what, five pounds or something. And that something beautiful that I could buy and bring into the house it would instantly make me feel happy. Mm -hmm. And because I drink a lot of tea and coffee, it was something that was continuously nurturing to me. Um, and then, of course, I've bought all like old ones from the 1960s and 70s that I'm a bit addicted to. <laughs> and my mum laughs at me because she always says I've just literally recreated the house that I grew up in in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> down to buying some of the same crockery that we had um and that kind you know I've even bought the same couch that we had back then it's just yeah so the yeah the teacups they just they I, I could keep going I have to sit on my hands on a daily basis when I see new pretty ones <laughs> but I, so you do use different ones every I day. Do or use ones. I love that. Like you look at them. Is do you? Oh, and sometimes it causes me anxiety because I can't <laughs> work out which one I want to use. <laughs> I could I can relate to that. <laughs> do you have special kinds of teas that you put in this in the in different cups? Like um, when you have grandma tea, do you have a special tea I'm that you use? Pretty much a. Um, I don't know. I drink Yorkshire tea which is just a standard black tea with milk, a lot. Um, and, yeah, I we have lots of other nice, you know, cinnamon ones and, like, herbally ones and all that kind of thing. But proper tea is definitely my favourite. That is just I, – I love I, – I, I think you showed a picture one time. Yeah, I think I have done. I, it, is, it is something that I have in my mind that I need to um, probably photograph. Being that I am at home all the time, I could probably um, do better with recording what we're going through now. And teacups are a big part of it because they make, they literally, they, they make me happy. <laughs> I know. Well, so then let's like move to other places in your house because you have other little collections of Alice in Wonderland things and <laughs> little fairy pixie things and yeah. wooden things. And what are some of your favorite little treasures that you found? And how does this look? Like, do you have a, a day that you go out and you know, junk shop or is it spontaneous or is it that you happen to be going someplace and look in the window? Oh, look at that. Now in your in, or is it, it a combination? Um, possibly a combination. I guess as I'm not getting out much, it's often a, if I do get out to the supermarket, it's a quick, Oh, if I park here, I can quickly sneak into a charity shop and have a look. Um, occasionally I suppose before Leaf was sick and I was out and about more um just going into sort of antique stroke junk shops just it makes me so excited I can't <laughs> even it's I feel like I try to be cool and I try to be calm about things but I mean one day I walked into a shop uh, just a charity shop and I literally squealed and the woman came running out of the back thinking that something had broken in the shop. <laughs> and I, she said, are you okay? Are you okay? And I was like, you have my favorite coffee cup. And I just, you know, it was like, I just had this little collection of plates and it was a coffee pot and she had the coffee pot that went with the plates that I had. And <laughs> I felt like I'd won the lottery. It was ridiculous. But it's, they lit, they just, it's all about, I think a lot of it's about memory. A lot of it is about 
um, I'm horribly sentimental and it's things. So if I see something that reminds me of my grandma or reminds me of being a small kid, it's like, I can't leave it behind. Um, and then I have so much stuff from when I was young anyway that never got thrown out. My mum never threw a single thing away that belonged to me when I was a child. So as an adult, I've had the pain stroke pleasure of having to go through all of that stuff and choosing which things to keep. Um, which things did you keep? <laughs> way more than my family would be grateful for, but I'm getting better. I've got it... Um, I think basically moving into this house has made me go through everything because mm. when we moved in here, I knew that this was going to be home. We weren't moving again because we've moved quite a lot of time since the kids were born. And I feel like I was carrying around a lot of stuff in case, you know, what, mm -hmm. you know and not knowing what space we would be living in. And, yeah, I have a lot, lot of old books that I had when I was young. I have little, I have a lot of things, I suppose, but that belong to my grandma. She used to have a glass cabinet that I was not allowed to touch but could sit outside. And I did. I used to sit and stare at these little glass animals that I've got now. And I wasn't allowed to play with them, but I used to imagine that I was playing with them. Um, so to kind of get all my treasures out and put them in their new home here now has felt utterly, I can't even, just so healing and so comforting. We've got in our spare room, um, I guess I originally thought we'd just stick a double bed in there and make it into a normal spare room. Um, but what happened was I had all the stuff from when my kids were little and then lots of stuff from when I was little and I just, there was nowhere to put it. So we kind of now have a children's room in the house, even though we have no <laughs> children, like young children. And it is like a giant hug when I walk in there. It mm. just feels amazing. And it's nice that when other people come, everybody loves staying in that room. Um, even though it is very childish, it looks like a ch you know children's room, but it feels just so comforting. And ev literally everything in there has a story or you know a memory for me. I love this whole bit. With this is actually, I understand your work a lot more talking with you about things like this because I do see a lot of memory or stories or secrets or very personal stories that I, I think of um, the new series that you've been working on the past couple of years, the Feathered Project. Yeah, and that's almost all these different layers of. It's almost like a chapter in a book or a page of a book. That's how they they read to me, but I don't know the reference point. So now knowing it's a combination of all of these little things that you've traversed in your life, that's how I read them because they're they're striking and they're. I think it's been a nice way for you to create, or do you tell me about them? Yeah, I, I shouldn't be making really this all really up. For interesting project, Pamela, because Phyllis. Um, the way that it started was that she took a picture of a feather, I think with her Polaroid camera. And she said, as she took the picture, she looked at it and it reminded her of something that I'd taken. And we were both at a point where our kids were too big to be taking the kind of pictures we enjoyed taking. Um, and obviously Leaf was sick. But it was also a strange feeling getting into photography, I suppose, wanting to take pictures of your kids. And then all of a sudden they grow up. And I had issues growing up myself 
I never wanted to. And then I had issues when my children grew up. I didn't want them to. I do love them, obviously, as they are big, but it wasn't, it happened far faster than I could have imagined. And so Phyllis and I were both at that point where we were lost with our photography. And she just approached me and said, what do you think about doing a project? And we just take a picture of a feather every week. And I just, without any thought, said yes. Three weeks in, I thought, shit, really? (laughs) What was I thinking? How am I going to take a picture of a feather every week for a year? There is just no way. I already don't know what to do next. And it seemed very, it felt contrived and it felt, just felt really difficult. So I wrote to Phyllis and she said, Uh, Yes, I feel the same way. And I said, well, let's just keep going. And together, we kind of decided that it was just for us. It wasn't for any, we weren't trying to prove anything to anybody. We weren't trying to gain anything out in the real world by it. And that, well, for me, I had to make the decision that even if I didn't love the picture that I'd taken... It was the process, it was a commitment, and that was, no matter what, I would stick to that promise that I'd made to Phyllis that, yes, I will take a picture every week and and we'll share them together. What felt nice about it was even the pictures that I wasn't happy with, um, that I, or some of them I actively didn't like, once they were matched with her picture, it kind of felt like her picture was holding my picture's hand and going out into the world. Mm. And that felt really safe. And it felt full of love somehow. And and then that made it not matter what it from a what anybody else thought, what I thought. It was it was it had an, it was its own had its own energy that was sort of pulling it forward. Um, From there, we just got on a roll and it was like we couldn't stop. Um, And again, I got go through stages where I feel a little bit frustrated because I have sort of these unattainable ideas of, you know, things that I would like to do or, people you know imaginary people that with imaginary feathers and you know like (laughs) pictures that would be too complicated for me stuck at home to produce um but it's interesting because it feels a bit fantastical it feels a bit mystical it feels um I don't know it's been a really good push and it's been good for me to have I think working with just one other photographer because other times when I've been involved with groups you feel like or if I don't join in it doesn't quite matter because there's so many other people Mm -hmm. but being that there's just the two of us I am very accountable to the project Um, I think we've skipped maybe two weeks once when uh, just recently when Leaf was quite unwell And another time we just, um, I think Phyllis was away or something. Um, But it, yeah, it feels healing. It feels fun. It feels playful. Sometimes I wish I could produce nicer images that were a bit more, um, I don't know, artistic or something. But overall, it's... It just feels so lovely to have that I not only I have a friend, but my image has a friend to go out into the world with. I think many of them, I, I think I had seen them because you guys shared them privately amongst I think Phyllis shared them privately amongst us for a little bit there. Yeah. And I, I have really seen it. You've stuck with it. Um, and you've, I've watched it grow and evolve. And there, there are many weeks that are just, there's, I don't have words for them. And 
I talk, so very little makes me mute. No. <laughs> That they're just, they're stunning. They're very, um, what was that one week where you did um, the, it was, there were nudes. There were two nudes, but it was very beautifully quiet there. It was week um, 24. Okay. Where you each had, there was like a little wing of almost like angel's wings of a feather. It was just, it was very sweet that it, it just happened that way. Cause I don't think you, you replicate your poses. No, one of, one of the things that we started to do, which has been really lovely because it is such a collaboration in the true sense is that if one of us is stuck, the other one will send either one image or several images to inspire the stuck person. Well, and that's beautiful. Doing that, it inspired, it's a couple of times it's inspired us. And it happened because some weeks we were just by chance creating similar images. I think our photography is quite similar anyway. Um, but we, so because it happened by chance, we then. You know, I think the first time it happened, I think I was stuck. And I said, I just, Phyllis, I don't know what to do this week. I can't think of anything. And she said, let me show you what I've got. And the minute I saw it, it just, I can't remember which image it was, but it just gave me an idea of what would look nice with it, would look, that would feel right with it, that would, um... Yeah, so it's just been a real togetherness project in terms of, you know, if we're stuck, we can, we can share something with the other one. And I think both of us wrote down a huge list of things at the beginning of the year that we were going to photograph. <laughs> um, and I think probably most of them, we had come up with many of the same ideas anyway. So so much, I guess, you can do with feathers. Um, but it was, I mean, there's some images that I took of Daisy with, um, feathers that I had used band-aids to stick on her back. Um, and <laughs> that's been, that some of those images are some of my favorite images I've ever yeah. taken. And that was just, again, just, I had a, a thought of somehow attaching feathers to her. And then there was something about, we couldn't work out how to do it. So I thought, well, I'll just try it with the band-aids just to see how it looks from the front. And then I just, it just seemed like so beautiful that these feathers were coming out of her back, but stuck on with these band-aids. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been inspiring in that way because I would never have come up with that idea just without playing around. There is so much you just said in all of that. The um, and I almost think it's a nice way to 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 wind down and, and close out this segment of f so often. And I'm I'm a culprit of this. I work in isolation a lot. Um, I was I think of it as as a kid. I spent a lot of time alone. I was a diver. I didn't I swam on a swim team, but I did individual and I liked diving. I liked single solo endeavors. But any time I've had good connections with other people around creating or photography, it's beautiful. And that is how wonderful on a on a on a pair as as a micro of a of a macro. Imagine what our world, particularly as I live in the United States, in the midst of I uh, an election season that's causing a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. Yeah. What you just said in that was how lovely that a picture has a friend to share a space with. It's that's a beautiful sentiment for for life, right? For photography. Yeah. For art, for writing, for whatever. There's with the competition and all these other things that people get into and I don't really get into the, I I can feel it sometimes and yeah. it has gotten my goat on a few times with certain individuals.
but I know that that's all my problem. That has nothing to do with anybody else. It is all about me being afraid. I'm not getting something I'm supposed to. I should have this. It's, it, it's, it's a lot of other things, but just the simplicity of a picture sharing, having a friend. <laughs> that's how what you've... it feels like. It really does. It, it, it just feels like you, I'm, my picture isn't alone. <laughs> it's just. I know. love that. And that's yeah. like the whole point for me of all of this is I guess that there is, you don't, we don't have to do this alone. No, it, it feels that way a lot of times, but it it's does. not that way, you yeah. know? And it, the other part that you said about the, um, uh, you would never have come up with that on your own, that this process. So it's, it still comes back again to you show up and things happen. You show up at the t at the little junk shop and oh, there's a pot that goes with my cups. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't make that happen without no. showing up. Yeah. And that's, that's what I hear over and over and, and really feel from a lot of your work is you just simply play and show up and, and work through the difficult times, but you have a friend to do it with, like whether it's Phyllis or other people, I always get the sense that there's somebody else involved in your heart. Yeah, there's definitely, I think, I mean, you said something earlier about the pictures looking like a storybook. Um, and I think that it, for me is, uh, there's something about books and children's books and the illustration of them and that sometimes it is just that it's just a story that feels like it's it's there with me no uh, that i totally see that and from talking with you i understand everything all makes sense with with everything the the things that i thought i knew right or not thought i knew the things i have felt but didn't know quite what the reference was completely. I just see you like little Alice in Wonderland playing in your little room, going down your little rabbit holes every day and, and having a whooping good time yeah, in, I from mean, a pure space. Yeah. The, the, one of the things this summer that I was playing with, 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 with the cyanotypes and I can't tell you, Pamela, I don't think I've ever been so happy in my life as shutting myself in my pantry and mixing my chemicals, painting them onto the paper and then going out in the sunshine. And it was just, it I felt like I was seven years old in the <laughs> best, best way. I just kind of, I could have, the rest of the world just disappeared and the days just disappeared in the mixing of the chemicals, in the collecting of the flowers um, and your Barbies. You're the only person I've ever known who put a Barbie or a doll, <laughs> a doll on your cyanotype. Because I loved that picture against the floral paper. Uh, at, at the same time, I was doing them as well with um, my father in law, who, well, he suddenly passed away just a month ago. And it was the, like a memory. It's a memory I will never forget. I mean, yeah. I still have the chemicals. He wanted me to make him one last picture. Oh. Or he he asked me to make him. He loved the he loved what I had done. And I just it flew me it took me right back to art school when everything was so free and expressive. I think that's and, what I liked about it uh, too. Was the you had in one sense you have no control. Exactly. And I love <laughs> I do too. It's, it's surrealist. It's yeah. pure surrealism of chance, right? Yeah. Gum printing was my absolute favorite. You have to try that. Yeah, I'm, di I'm literally dying to get into just trying all the different. I think for me, also the other thing is that with the digital photography, it's so, well, one, it's so fast and I enjoy it so much that I kind of want to make it. Slow make down. Slow down. And yeah, and I think that those old processes do that, don't they? They slow it down. They mm -hmm. give you something more to physically do. Um, and it's not because I know I can't draw and I can't paint. Um, and I think that was always a problem for me growing up because 
I felt the creativity, but didn't know what to do with it. How to channel. I, yeah, I, I, re- I can draw. I could draw an illustration, more or less copy an illustration onto the wall and color. I love to color. But I will say this. I, I did not think I could draw. And yes. part one requirement in art school was um, life drawing. As it was in architecture, we had to we had to draw three times a week. And uh, the first time I sat in an art class with a nude, I think it was a, a woman, the the one, and then a nude man. I <laughs> every I'm I'm like a closet prude in some ways. I was like <laughs> horrified, and I didn't know what to do. And I'm like you know, having a mild panic attack and everybody's just, you know, very cool about the whole thing. And I'm like freaking out in my own little world. But with every week, what the teacher pointed this out at the very end of it, she said, I've watched you every week, you moved your easel a little closer and a little closer to where now you're directing the model. You've completely come out of your shelf. And I found a way to draw, but I drew every single day for two years. Oh, wow. And I did learn how to draw. I've stopped and I'm terrible now, but I did. It was almost like an instrument. I think we have a preconceived notion that you just, boom, people draw. No, people don't draw. Some people learn how to and then develop the practice of drawing. Some people, it comes very fluidly. But like anything else, if you do it enough, you'll find your own way with it. So it's, it's, as I, I just wanted to, I had to say that because I didn't think I could draw either, but I yeah. could if I practiced. If you practiced, yeah. Well, Lily, the, I'm going to, we, we've been, I think about an hour, which is what we try to keep it at. Okay. I, I have so enjoyed this on every possible oh. level. I feel like we just opened up a, a children's book and read a story together oh, that just happened so to feature your to pictures. Your voice as well. <laughs> Likewise, it was good to see you. And um, if you, I will yeah. be on touch on the back end with everything of what happens next. All right, darling. And just thank you so much. This has been another episode of My Life Creative with Richard Zombeck and Pamela Joy. You can find us online at mylifecreative.com where you'll find more information about us, our guests, and while you're there, please consider supporting the show to help us produce more content like this. Oh yeah, can you feel it? Just over the credits, just riffing now. Words and chords not the poetry and the real thing but not bad for an ad lib not good but and it's not long enough so just do a little bit more and that's nearly done that's the final credit there's the end 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 Credit the last end. No 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 credit the last end.